Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul I'm Jean-Michel Cousteau. I am the Hudson River Keeper. We have a very distinguished group here to address you today on a topic of surpassing importance. And before we begin, before I make my introductions, we have a special bonus. We have a video prepared for us, especially by Mr. Jean-Michel Cousteau of Ocean Futures. And I'm going to ask the folks who are running the proceedings to please show the video. I'm Jean-Michel Cousteau. I'm honored to have a chance to offer my thoughts on the critical issue of nuclear power in New York and Boston. I regret that due to prior commitments, I cannot be with you in person. My initial introduction to the ocean by my father, Jacques Cousteau, impressed upon me some important fact about our planet. These were, we live on a planet bathed in two fluids, the ocean and the atmosphere. These fluids are in constant motion, each interacting with the other and each reaching every corner of the planet. Because of these facts, nothing can be thrown away because there is no away. Everything is connected. And whatever pollutant is released anywhere on the planet has the potential to have impacts everywhere. I believe these facts are particularly relevant to the discussion about nuclear power. Human arrogance and error are part of reality as our natural disasters totally out of our control. This means that it is absolutely certain that there will be unpredictable events capable of upsetting the best of our human engineered enterprises. In the case of a power human error, a natural disaster may topple a wind generator, damage a photovoltaic panels, and even destroy a petroleum-based power plant. But the consequences of these will be microscopic compared to the impact of a nuclear power plant going down. This has been proven true with the Fukushima and Chernobyl catastrophes. Those who choose to ignore the past are doomed to repeat it. I urge you to learn from Fukushima and Chernobyl so we don't have to see these catastrophes repeated. I applaud all of you for addressing the important issue of nuclear power plant and trust you will think of your children and all future generations to come as you make important policy decisions. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you and hope that great decisions can be made for the future of our species. Before I begin some introductory remarks, 
I want you all to join me in thanking the organizer of today's session, the Samuel Lawrence Foundation. Thank you very much. I also want to recognize groups too numerous to mention who were involved in the planning of this exercise. This is an extremely capable, dedicated, wise group of activists we have working on the issues associated with Fukushima, Indian Point, Oyster Creek, and all the other nuclear facilities in this country. Again, my organization is Hudson River Keeper. Hudson River Keeper uh, was formed 46 years ago uh, to protect the Hudson River, and since then we've broadened our mission to involve protecting the drinking water supply for nine million New Yorkers, a drinking water supply that would be very severely compromised in any accident involving Indian Point. We've been focusing on the Indian Point issue because of its impacts on marine populations for decades. But in the wake of 9-11, we realized that we're not only in it to protect the fish, there's a very serious risk to the people of this region from, nu from nuclear energy at Indian Point. And so we've dedicated ourselves to opposing the relicensing of Indian Point, which I believe is why I'm here this morning as the moderator. But today's panel is why we're really here. It's an extraordinary group of people, a former head of state who faced the world's largest and most severe nuclear disaster, a man who was the chief regulator of America's nuclear industry during that crisis with responsibilities for Americans who were in proximity to Fukushima at the time of the disaster, another man who spent 40 years as an insider in the industry, giving him unique perspective on all of this. A former nuclear regulator during America's most significant nuclear crisis. And joining us later on this morning, our country's leading public advocate, who has been called one of the 100 most influential figures in American history. Together, these men are perhaps the most experienced authoritative voices imaginable on one of the most important topics any of us confronts at present, the Fukushima disaster and its implications for New York. These men understand the poorly lit corners where engineering, and science, and plant operations, regulatory activity, and disaster relief come together or don't come together, as the case may be. Those who are former, uh, former public officials have had access to the briefings that those of us in the audience will never see. They've talked with the experts in the context of these severe disasters, and they are going to bring us information that we would otherwise never have an opportunity to hear. So this is a wonderful opportunity for us all this morning. And those of you who are listening and watching online, or those of you who have access to cell phones, which I'm sure you've turned the sound off on by now, or will after I say this, please let your friends and your colleagues know of the opportunity to see this presentation on live stream. I'm sure we'll manage to get it up after the fact, but there is nothing so immediate and so vital is seeing speeches like this in real time. So those of you who are here this morning, you are a lucky group. Those of you who are watching online, please bring others in as well. Now, at this point, I think that it is my great pleasure to introduce our very first speaker, former Prime Minister of Japan, Naoto Kan. In 2011, Mr. Khan was Japan's prime minister during the Fukushima nuclear disaster. At one point, facing a situation where there was a chance that people might not be able to live in the capital zone, including Tokyo, and would have to evacuate. Mr. Khan declared the need for Japan to end its reliance on atomic power and promote renewable sources of energy, such as solar, but have long taken a back seat in the resource-poor country of Japan's energy mix. Mr. Khan resigned as prime minister in August 2011 and now serves the Democratic Party of Japan to garner support for
for alternative energy policies. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Naoto Khan. まず講演を始める前に、えー、アメリカの皆さんニューヨークの皆さんに、えー、お礼を申し上げなければなりません。言うまでもなく2011年に起きた東日本大震災それに伴って起きた福島原発事故に際して多くのアメリカの皆さんから大変心温かいサポートをいただいたことを当時の総理として改めてお礼を申し上げます。So in the aftermath of the, um, the great uh, earthquake um, in Japan in the year 2011 and the subsequent uh, nuclear disaster, um, we have received um, a lot of support from uh, people around the world. また今日はあこのニューヨークにおいて、えー、インディアンポイントの原発を心配される皆さんがこういう会を催されるということで、私にあの招待をいただいたことを大変光栄に思っております。I feel quite honored to be here、uh, with the, by the invitation of people who are、uh, trying to work on the issues of Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant. せっかくの機会ですので、福島原発事故、特にその事故が起きて最初の5日間について、少し詳しく皆さんに当時のことをお伝えしたいと思います。Like to, um, uh, えー、2011年3月11日の午後2時46分に、えー、大震災が発生いたしました。Uh, At 2:46、uh, p.m. of March 11, 2011. 最初に、えー、福島原発について、えー、私に届いた情報は、無事にすべ、えー、ての原発が停止をした、スクラムによって停止をしたという知らせでした。その時は、uh, ほっとしたことを覚えております。The first report that I have I received、um, after the earthquake was that、um, All the reactors、uh, in Japan,、uh, all the reactors safely shut down, and that great, greatly relieved me. しかし、それから1時間ほどのうちに、まず、すべての電源が喪失をした、さらには、すべての冷却機能が失われた、この報告が来たときに、私は冷却ができなくなれば、メルトダウンを起こすということを地域地として持っておりましたので、本当に大変な事故になったと、切筋が寒くなる思いをいたしました。But shortly after the initial report, I received another one that said that the,、um, I'm assuming he said, talking about Fukushima, at Fukushima d a i c h site, they have、um, reactors lost the、um, external power.、Um, And also,、uh, as a consequence, they have、um, lost the,、um, the cooling、uh, capacity. And I, Prime Minister, had the,、um, some knowledge about the nuclear technology, and he realized that, that this could lead to a、uh, you know, ser serious catastrophe, and a chill ran in his spine. So, in the w o r l 当時は原発についてまだ圧力容器の中に水がある第1号機も
まだ水があるという報告がその日の夜まで来ておりました。しかし現在の検証によりますとわずか地震が起きてから5時間後の午後8時には1号機でメルトダウンが起きそして引き続いて圧力容器のこの20センチにも及ぶ熱い鉄の容器を溶かしてメルトするが起き溶けた燃料が核の容器の底に落ちたこれが現在分かっている事実であります。But today we know that the,、um, just five hours after the um, um, earthquake, like 8 p.m. Of, of that evening,、um, at the、uh, number one reactor,、uh, there was the,、um, uh, the water was evap has, had evaporated and there was a melt through,、um, breaking through the two centimeter、uh, thickness of the wall of、uh, pressure vessel. And that the、uh, molten Uh, was basically going under, on the bottom of the、uh, vessel. And the molten melted fuel basically on the bottom of the containment vessel was heating the concrete underneath. And it was on the verge of just the breaking through, and the radioactivity was about to go outside. もしそうした状況になっていれば、えー、もうほとんどの人間が、えー、1号機ばかりでなく、福島第一原発に近寄ることすらできなくなっていたと思われます。Had that been, had, had that occurred, thank God it didn't, but、um, uh, nobody could go near,、um, not including the reactor, not just the number one reactor, but near the Fukushima nuclear power plant site today. まあそうなる直前に、えー、第一号機に水を入れることが可能になり、それによって、えー、核の容器の底を削ることがを止めることができました。And but、uh, fortunately. Uh, we were able to、uh, pour water into the、uh, number one reactor and we were able to stop the,、um, the development of further、um, melting the, the bottom. しかし翌日の12日午後には1号機が水素爆発を起こしました。However,、uh, the next day、uh, on, on the、um, 12th in the afternoon,、uh, the reactor number one、um, had the、um, hydrogen、uh, explosion. そして一日置いた3月14日には3号機が水素爆発を起こしました。そしてその翌日15日、私が朝早く東電の本店に。乗り込んだその日の午前6時には2号機が核の容器が壊れまたほぼ同時に4号機で水素爆発が起きました company What was happening at the Fukushima Daiichi site was that the、uh, reactor number two,、uh, the、um, containment vessel, broke, and then num-、uh, reactor number four also had the、uh, hydrogen explosion. 
at the same, those two uh, uh, events occurred at the same time. このようにわずか4日間の間に3つの原子炉がメルトダウンメルトスローを起こしまた4つの原発が水素爆発を起こすというこういう事故はもちろん世界で初めてであります。So within four days, um, three of the four reactors had either meltdown or melt through and four of them had hydrogen explosion. Explosions, and there was no such、um, severe、um, accident, in, you know, before historically speaking. I was in the hospital for a few days. I was in the hospital for a few days. I was in the hospital for a few days. I was in the hospital for a few days. At the, my office、uh, overnight and every night, and wearing those, you know, the emergency response、uh, sort of a, a garb, and I just stay there. I was thinking that it was just one thing that this accident would be able to spread out, and how to stop it from spreading out. And how to stop it from spreading out, and how to stop it from spreading out, and how to stop it from spreading out. そのことを常に考えておりました。What was going through my mind at the time?、Um, how far is this going? I mean, how worse is this going to get? And how can we, can we stop this from getting worse? And how far do we have to、uh, evacuate people? What, you know, how far are people going to be affected? そしてその時に頭にあったのはチェルノブイリの事故のに関する報告を私が以前読んだことがあるそのことであります。And also I was mindful of the, re、uh, the report of Chernobyl accident that you know I had read. チェルノブイリの事故は大変厳しい事故でありましたが、えー、事故を起こした原発は一機であります。It was a, a severe accident at Chernobyl. However, they only had one reactor. しかし福島の場合は、第一サイトに六基の原発、そして十二キロ先の第二サイトにさらに四基の原発、合わせて十基の原発が存在しました。However, at Fukushima,、uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant,、uh, they had six reactors. And、uh, at the Fukushima Daini, which is、uh, 12 kilometers away, they had four. So altogether, 10 reactors were close,、um, you know, closely situated. また、第一第二サイトを合わせて、使用済み燃料ポールが11存在しました。Also, uh, spent, uh, fuel pools, in, you know, including Daiichi and Daini, there are altogether 11 of them. もしこの10の原発と11の使用済み燃料プールがコントロールフローになったときにはチェルノブイリの何倍何十倍倍量によっては何百倍もの量の放射性物質が放出されるとそのように考えました。I've, I realize that the,、uh, if、uh, all those 10 reactors with、um, 11 uh, spent fuel pools all together If we cannot control them, then we're going to have a radio radiation、um, leak into the atmosphere, worse, maybe 10 times, even 100 times worse、um, that of a Chernobyl accident. So, at that time, Tokyo is a very large area of people who are in the world. Um, I fear that in that、uh, foreseeable, I mean, in a there is a possibility that the, uh, the uh, area, include the area including Tokyo, might be affected. I'm, you know, we might have to evacuate so many people. その後、原子力委員会の近藤委員長に専門家の立場から最悪のケースをシミュレーションしてもらいました。And、um, I tasked the、um, uh, commissioner of uh, uh, 
Atomic Energy uh, Commission, uh, Mr. Kondo, um, to uh, come up with a simulation of the uh, worst case scenario. スイスオニアがやってきたからの報告もほぼ私の考えと同じで250キロ圏、福島から250キロ圏、これは東京も含みます。この範囲から5000万人の人々が避難しなければならなくなるというのが最悪のケースとして述べられておりました。また事故が起きた翌日にはアメリカ政府あるいはアメリカ大使館は日本にいるアメリカ人に対して福島原発から50マイルの範囲からは避難するようにという勧告を出されました翌日というのはいつの翌日ですか翌日というのはいつの翌日ですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそうですそ
the original uh, the uh, topography of the Fukushima Daiichi site was that the um, it was like a 35 meter high cliff. しかし、建設の時、東電は、高いところに水を、冷却用の水をあげるのは、経済的に大変、費用がかかるので、海面から10メートルの高さまで土を切って、その海面から10メートルの高さに、6つの原発を建設したわけです。However, Tokyo Electric Power Company did not want to spend the money to、um, pump the water. 35 meter high,、uh, the cooling water. So, what they chose to do was to、um, basically level the、um, sort of a scrape the、uh, cliff up to like a 10 meter from the sea level. And then that's where、uh, the six reactors were、uh, constructed. この土を切ることによって、もともと地下水が非常に豊富な地形でしたので、その地下水が原発の下を流れて、えー、海に、えー、流れ込んでもともとおりました。Oh. So what that ended up doing is was that the、um, you know that place had the plenty of groundwater to begin with, but by lowering the ground level,、uh, basically the uh, uh, groundwater is running right underneath those reactors. 現在の状況は原発事故によって生まれた汚染した水がその地下水と混ざってそしてその一部が海に流れて出ているのではないかというこういう心配が今も続いております。So our concern today is that the,、uh, the uh, radioact- you know, radioactive particles、uh, from the,、uh, those、uh, broken reactors are now mixed in with the groundwater and some of that is leaching into the ocean. 私自身、3.11 の福島原発事故が起きるまでは、原発については安全性をしっかり確認した上で、それを活用する、そのことを私自身もそうすべきだと考え、そういう立場で臨んでおりました。My position、uh, pro- before March 11th,、uh, 2011 was that as long as we make sure that, that the safety is、uh, um, safely operated, nuclear power plant can be operated and should be operated. しかし、3.11 の事故を経験してから、私は考え方を180度変えました。However, after experiencing、uh, the disaster of March 11th, I changed、uh, my thinking 180 degrees completely. まあ飛行機事故や他の事故で、えー、何百人という人が一度に亡くなることはあります。しかし、五、え、千、ー、万人もの人が逃げ出さなければならなくなるといったような事故は、戦争以外ではこの原発事故を除いてはありません。You know, we do have、uh, accidents such as, say, air, you know, air, airplane crash and so on. And sometimes hundreds of people die in an accident. But there is no other accident or disaster that would affect 50 million people, maybe a war. But there is no other、um, accident can cause such a tragedy. また、原発がなければ、すぐにも多くの人が飢え死にするといったような事態になるのであれば、ある期間、原発を続けるとは仕方ありませんけれども、決してそうではない、原発を使わなくても、エネルギー、電気は十分に供給できるということを、現在の日本は実証しております。If We had a situation where, by stopping,、uh, by not utilizing nuclear power plants at all, you know, if that happens, then maybe just so many people、uh, would starve to death or something. If we had a situation like that, that's one thing. But what we have seen、um, in Japan today is that, you know, it, even without nuclear power plants, we can actually、uh, supply energy to meet our demands. 
私が総理の時の最後の仕事は、再生可能な自然エネルギーによる発電を増やすために、フィードインタリフ、固定価格買取制度を導入することでした。The last thing I did as the Prime Minister before I left the office was to um, um, establish the feed in tariff um, system、uh, in order to encourage the、uh, more renewable energy production generation. その結果、その制度導入から1年間の間に、原発にして3基分の電力を太陽光発電で供給することになりました。What happened、uh, was that within in, in one year after the feed-in tariff、uh, was installed,、um, Japan increased the capacity of solar power、uh, generation、um, equivalent of three nuclear reactors. また、福島原発となった福島県の海の沖に、えー、巨大な浮いた風力発電の実験が始まっております。We are all,、uh, people are also、um, experimenting with the、um, wind、uh, power generator, floating wind power、uh, generator off the coast of Fukushima today. この実験が成功すれば、一気について7メガ、7000キロワットの風力発電を140機、えー、福島のいわき市沖に並べることになっております。If、um, this experiment、uh, is successful, then we might see,、um, you know, per one uh, uh, generator, I mean unit, you can create 7,000 kilowatt of electricity, and we could have 140 of them. すでにドイツでは2022年に原発を廃止することを決めると同時に、2050年までには、石油や天然ガスを含む化石燃料の使用もやめて、すべてのエネルギーを再生可能な自然エネルギーで供給するという目標を掲げて、すでにドイツは進,め進んでおります。Uh, Germany has set a goal of, um, uh, Eliminating all nuclear power、uh, by 2022. And also by 2050, they're, they, they're trying to not rely on、um, any fossil fuel for, for power. And so all the、uh, power will be supplied by renewable energy. That is their goal today. 地球温暖化は海面上昇だけではなくて IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。IPCC。
最後に、えー、この数ヶ月の私の経験をお話をしてみたいと思います。Um, in この今年6月にはカリフォルニアのサンオノフレ原発配置の皆さん、今日の皆さんと一緒にシンポジウムを行いまして、サンオノフレ原発の廃炉が決まったことを大変嬉しく思っております。Uh, Visiting、uh, the, you know, the San Onofre nuclear power plant area and、uh, participating in symposium just like this. And it was a, a, pleasure,、uh, it was a pleasure to receive the、um, news that the、uh, San Onofre nuclear power plant、uh, is going to shut down permanently. <laughs> 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 今年の9月には台湾の第4原発の反対運動グループに呼ばれました。台北首都からわずか9キロのところに予定されている原発について、特に台湾の女性グループが強い反対の活動を始めております。In September, I traveled to Taiwan.、Uh, there's a、um, women's group, especially,、um, leading the、uh, sort of a fight against the creation of the、uh, The number four、uh, po nuclear power plant or reactor there. And,、uh, and then that would, would be situated、um, only nine kilometers from the, its capital of Taipei. また今年の9月にはあの、我が国の伊方、えー、原発、四国にある伊方原発の近くで、安、えー、子さんたちにおいでをいただいて、えー、シンボジウムを行い、地域の皆さんが伊方原発の廃止に向けて大変勇気づけられました。And also in September,、uh, with uh, Dr. Yatsuko here,、um, we were uh, at the uh, Ikata uh, uh, nuclear power plant in the southern part, western part of Japan, and we participated in symposium there and、uh, you know, just met with the people in the community. Who are trying to shut, shut it down. そして、えー、最近の我が国の大きなニュースは、今なお,お人気の高い<笑>小泉元首相がフィンランドのオンカロを視察した後、やはり原発をやめるべきだ、まあ、このように発言したことであります。The、former Prime Minister、uh, Koizumi,、uh, I think he was in the office in the early part of 2000s.、Um, he's quite, still quite popular today in Japan. And he actually、um, announced that the,、uh, made a statement that he opposes a nuclear power now after、um, visiting Onkalo in Finland, which is the um, uh, permanent uh, nuclear uh, depository.、Uh, 小泉元首相は現在の安倍首相のい、まあ、わばボスにあたる人物でありまして、えー、そういった意味ではあ日本の現在の政府に対しても大きなあ原発をやめていく圧力になりつつあると見ております。Interestingly, former Prime Minister Koei Zumi has a lot of influence over Current Prime Minister Abe. So, how is this going to play out in the po you know, politics in the near future? That's going to be very interesting. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to say this. Technically, it is impossible、um, to、um, el eliminate nuclear power plant accident. There is only one way to eliminate accident. Which Which, which is to、uh, get rid of all nuclear power plant. 
and that has to be done by the will of people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Naoto Khan. Our next speaker is Dr. Gregory Yachko. Dr. Yachko is former chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, he was first sworn in as a commissioner of the U U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, on January 21, 2005. On May 13, 2009, President Obama designated him the organization's chairman. During the Fukushima crisis, Chairman Yachko recommended that Americans evacuate 50 miles outside Fukushima. <coughs> On February 9, 2012, Dr. Yachko cast the lone dissenting vote on plans to build the first new nuclear power plant uh, in more than 30 years when the NRC voted four to one to allow Atlanta-based Southern Company to build and operate two new nuclear power reactors at its existing Votal new nuclear power plant in Georgia. Dr. Yachko cited safety concerns stemming from Japan's 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster, stating, quote, I cannot support issuing this license as if Fukushima never happened. His pro-safety stance caused much friction with his fellow commissioners, resulting in his departure from the NRC. He has since been appointed to a post on a congressional panel overseeing the National Nuclear Security Administration. Please welcome Dr. Gregory Yachko. Well, thank you for that uh, warm introduction. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, talk to all of you about my thoughts on uh, the Fukushima accident and uh, uh, what I think is the legacy of uh, nuclear accidents in general uh, in Japan, the United States, and, and throughout the rest of the world. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with this group of individuals. Uh, I've had the opportunity to sit on uh, panels and, and uh, attend other meetings with, with this group, and it's, a, I think, a, a tremendous honor and a privilege for me. I uh, also want to thank uh, Prime Minister Khan for his leadership, not only during the accident uh, in Japan, but after the accident. I think his uh, strong statements and his uh, leadership in moving not just Japan, but I think the world to reconsider all of our energy choices in the future is extremely important, and I, and I want to thank him for his, um, his leadership. <coughs> I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, the accident in Japan. Uh, Mr. Khan, I talked in a very personal way about the details that he was dealing with. I'll talk to you about it from a slightly different perspective uh, and how I saw the accident transpire here in the United States, and in particular how it affected the people who work and um, uh, deal with nuclear power in this country, as well as is throughout the world. And I want to focus a little bit ab about what the impact was here in the United States, the kinds of lessons we learned, the lessons we should have learned, and perhaps the lessons we have not yet actually learned. And then talk a little bit about where things stand, not only in Japan, uh, but he here in the United States as well, and what this means as we look to the future. When the accident uh, began, it began with an earthquake followed by a tsunami uh, that struck uh, off the coast of Japan on March 11, uh, 2011. At the time, I was um, at home uh, just waking up, and I got a phone call from the NRC Operations Center uh, saying that there had been an earthquake in Japan, uh, and there was a tsunami warning and tsunami alert at that time. The first thought uh, that the NRC focused on, that I focused on, was what kind of impact this tsunami could have on plants on the west coast in the United States. The, uh, 
there were forecasts of a potential for a, a, a low or, or small tsunami uh, to reach the, the west coast. Uh, and uh, so we monitored the plants and all of the uh, activities related to, to the tsunami with those plants on the west coast. Thankfully, the impacts were minimal and there, there was not ultimately uh, any, any impact to those plants. At the same time in Japan, there were really two crises uh, unfolding. The first was a tremendous humanitarian challenge um, with the people who were directly impacted from the earthquake and the tsunami. Uh, I was um, part of discussions uh, focusing on the nuclear issue, but became privy to discussions and, and activities on the part of the U.S. government to help assist with uh, the humanitarian efforts to deal with the tragedy from the tsunami uh, in, in, on the West Coast. In the beginning part, in the first day of this incident, there were very few people who anticipated or expected that weeks, months later, we would see one of the most significant nuclear reactor accidents uh, in, in history. And perhaps more importantly, one of the most significant nuclear accidents involving technology that was closely associated with technology here used in the United States and ultimately that came from the United States. So it was in the context of this tremendous humanitarian crisis that these issues began to develop. For the next nine months, a period of time that I think is unprecedented in the studies, analysis, and models that are done about nuclear power plant accidents, the Fukushima reactors continued to be fundamentally in an accident condition. Normally, when a nuclear power plant shuts down or the nuclear reaction turns off, systems turn on to cool the reactor fuel and prevent it from having a significant accident. At the Fukushima Daiichi site, those systems failed. So for the next nine months, the nuclear fuel would be too hot and would release significant amounts of radiation. As time went on, the radiation decreased as the fuel became cooler. And ultimately, in December of 2011, I had the pleasure and the opportunity to go to Japan and meet with many of the colleagues that I worked with closely in the Japanese government and talk to them about the success in bringing that reactor under control and ending ultimately the accident. But at that time, we talked about the fact that this was just the beginning of the cleanup work, cleanup work that would take decades to complete. <clears throat> so when we think about this accident, it's important to keep in mind many of the myths about nuclear power that the accident challenged. And there were many, many significant myths that were challenged. The most probably important was the myth that I think had developed here in the United States, that had developed throughout the world with people in pr principle who used technology different from Soviet or Russian uh, reactor technology. And there was a, a myth that had developed that accidents would not happen, in particular severe accidents would not happen in these reactor types. You would never see an accident progress beyond uh, a minimal release of radiation contained within the, the nuclear reactor buildings that are designed to do that. And in fact, at the NRC, we would annually conduct exercises to simulate these reactor accidents. And there was always discussions about how complicated and convoluted we had to make these scenarios to actually ever get to an accident or to a, re a simulated release that we could then test the emergency response capabilities. Of course, Mother, Mother Nature has a way of confounding all of us and came up with a, a very simple way at Fukushima. So that first myth of accidents never happening was challenged. And not only was it challenged once, but it was challenged three times. Three reactors ultimately underwent severe accidents at the Fukushima site. A number, again, that was very uh, unusual and unexpected to see a single reactor site have three reactors simultaneously undergoing a severe accident. As we look at the accident and what happened, one of the next important myths that was challenged was that any release of radiation would be small and would be contained within the reactor buildings and the containment structures that were designed specifically to do that. 
Of course, that was not the case at the Fukushima Daiichi site. And one of the reasons was because of the hydrogen explosions that occurred early on in the accident. Again, an area that many had believed had been properly addressed and properly dealt with so that even if there was an accident that became serious, the impacts of hydrogen would not lead to the kinds of explosions that were seen. Of course, this was an issue, and perhaps Peter Bradford will talk more about it, this was an issue that developed at Three Mile Island. As the fuel melt began, ultimately, uh, there was an accumulation of hydrogen in, in the containment building uh, at uh, the Three Mile Island site. So for decades, this has been a known, a known phenomenon. Systems were put in place, procedures were developed, and methodologies were, were established to ensure that in the event of an accident, a hydrogen explosion would not occur. So again, a myth and a belief that was challenged. Another that was significantly confronted, and again, was a legacy of the Three Mile Island accident, was that we had understood finally how to properly conduct emergency plans and implement emergency plans and conduct emergency evacuations. Clearly, the accident in Fukushima showed that those plans are never as simple to implement as they appear to be, and that unique challenges always occur, which make those even more difficult to implement in reality than we can ever imagine. And finally, as Prime Minister Khan touched on, we shattered the myth that we fully understand all the natural hazards that can impact nuclear power plants, not only in Japan, but of course throughout the world. When we think about this accident then, it's important to keep in mind the personal human toll that the accident has taken. The immediate aftermath, as I said, of the, the, the tsunami and the earthquake had a tremendous impact on tens of thousands of people. Lives were lost, people went missing. So you add to that then the stress and anxiety of now having to confront after all of the water has, has receded back into the sea, to now confront the difficult challenges over the next several weeks of dealing with the evacuations of over 100,000 people. When I visited Japan uh, in August of 2012, I had an opportunity to visit with some of the families that had been evacuated as a result of the nuclear power plant accident. There's nothing more difficult and challenging than to look in the eyes of a, a grandfather who no longer sees his children or grandchildren because they have had to move on to another area to find jobs, to relocate their families. I met with an individual, a man who had a, on the wall the, the family tree that he uh, had for his children and his grandchildren. These were people that used to live in the same town in which he lived. So to tell these people that they had to be evacuated, that their lives were gonna be perhaps permanently disrupted in ways that we can only imagine is, is something that I, I hope no one ever has to go through again. For all of you who live in the New York City area, you can imagine what it's like to have to deal with this by thinking about the Superstorm Sandy that hit New York City uh, recently. During that storm, parts of New York City were left without power for, for weeks. Now imagine multiplying that and taking those weeks and turning those into years. Imagine having to be outside of your home not for weeks while power was restored, but perhaps permanently. To never see anymore the home where you've marked the growth of your children, the, the, the life important lessons and, and, and events that have marked your life and those of your family and your friends and all of your community. Imagine having to have that taken from you for a period of time that is undetermined. That is the tragedy and the human toll that the accident of Fukushima has, has enacted on nearly 100,000 people in Japan. You cannot put those impacts into dollar terms. You cannot put those impacts into, into terms that are easy to discuss or easy to measure. But they are very real, and it is one of the most difficult aspects of this accident and one of the most important issues that we have to keep in mind. Now, stepping aside from those difficult challenges that we, we have a hard time measuring, there are real measurable impacts from the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. 
there is the significant land contamination and the economic impact that has occurred in Japan. 30% of the country's electricity is not available in the usual manner because of the shutdown of all of the nuclear power plants as a result of the accident. And an estimate that was done in 2012 by a independent organization, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, they concluded in their report, and, and this is a direct quote, that the current rough estimate of the total cost to Japan from the Fukushima Daiichi accident is about 500 billion US dollars. And this is perhaps the most important piece of this statement, which will substantially increase if nuclear electricity generation continues to be replaced for a long time by other means. And of course, that's the situation now that is happening in Japan. So $500 billion is the minimum cost and impact of this accident in Japan. So what does all of this tell us, and what does it ultimately mean? First and foremost, it, we have to recognize what it's telling us, that severe accidents can and most likely will happen at some point. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not in 10 years, maybe not in 30 years, but they will happen. There will be ways that Mother Nature, that human mistakes and errors will lead to these kinds of severe accidents at nuclear power plants. But moreover, what this accident is telling us is that society does not accept the consequences from these severe accidents. Society does not ultimately find it acceptable to evacuate hundreds of thousands of people, to have areas of land be, be permanently contaminated, to spend close to half a trillion or more dollars to deal with the aftermath of an accident at a facility that is simply designed to generate electricity. So what this accident fundamentally should be telling us is that for nuclear power plants to be considered safe, nuclear power plants should not produce accidents like this. And by should not, I don't mean that they have a low probability or that they have a very little likelihood or that they have a one in 10 million year probability. I mean simply that they should not be able to produce accidents like this. That is what the public has said quite clearly after the Fukushima accident. And that is, I think, quite clearly what we need to use as a new safety standard for nuclear power going forward. <laughs> now turning to the United States, I think when we look at the impact of the accident in the United States, there's an unfortunate reality that too many people continue to believe that an accident will not happen here in the United States. And as time goes on and no accidents happen, that belief will continue to increase. But I think it's extremely important that we focus on this issue and focus on trying to address these challenges now to ensure that we don't suffer the kind of accidents that we saw at Fukushima Daiichi here in the United States. You know, I always think about this idea that because an accident hasn't happened means that one won't happen when we think about car insurance. For all of you out there who have cars and have car insurance, I'm sure you'd love to be able to call up your insurer and say, well, you should insure me for free because I've never had an accident in my car. And for those of you who've had accidents, then you can, I'm sure, tell them, well, I've had my accident and I will never have another one again. So you should insure me for free uh, in everything that I do when I drive my car. And of course, the insurance companies will happily tell you that that's ridiculous. Uh, accidents happen, that's why we insure you. So this idea that because an accident's never happened doesn't here in the United States of, of a severe magnitude does not mean that one won't. So we have to think about all of this in a new way. Now I talked about one of these tremendous myths about nuclear power that we fully understand natural hazards. And in the context here of the United States and this idea that, well, the Fukushima accident was a Japanese accident. It, it, it recognized and it, and it, and it pointed to problems in the Japanese system, I simply think that's not true. Around the time of the accident at, at uh, Fukushima, and while that accident was continuing to transpire, we had our own challenges with natural hazards here in the United States. A plant in Nebraska, the Fort Calhoun station, experienced significant flooding. Flooding, in fact, that it exceeded the plan design limits for the plant itself. 
but thanks to some intrepid work by an NRC inspector and staff at the NRC, the challenge with this flooding was identified prior to the actual flooding event, and emergency systems and additional measures were put in place to protect the plant. And that was done just about a year before the plant actually experienced incredibly significant flooding that caused that plant to shut down and a plant that then has had a number of significant safety challenges that have required it to undergo a very significant oversight review and to be shut down for an extended period of time. At the same time, here on the East Coast, we experienced an earthquake, an earthquake that was small compared to the earthquake in Japan, but nonetheless an earthquake that exceeded the design specifications for a plant very near to the earthquake site in Virginia. Thankfully, that plant did not experience any significant impacts, but again, it showed us that our thinking and our understanding of the limits on Mother Nature have been too low and we've underestimated. A plant in, in, along the, the Tennessee River, the Watts Bar facility, also has experienced challenges with flooding. So this idea that we fully understand and we fully know how natural hazards will occur here in the United States at nuclear power plants is simply not true. <clears throat> Unfortunately, as I said, I think in the United States there have not been enough impacts from this accident. There have not been enough learnings from the kinds of things that, that have gone on. And what I saw from the NRC was at the same time that this accident was transpiring, there was a tremendous push by the nuclear power industry to ensure that the NRC continued to move forward with almost no pause on the activities to license new nuclear facilities, some of the first new licensing activities in decades. And clearly this activity was premature. Clearly we had not yet fully understood all of the lessons and all of the, the challenges that the Fukushima accident identified. It is unthinkable to me that at that time there was such a pressure to move forward and that there was almost no hesitation on the part of the nuclear industry to say, let's take a pause. Let's understand these lessons. Let's, let's make our plants safer, and let's, let's take a pause and slow down before we do that. As a result, when those plants ultimately came up for licensing, I asked for a very simple condition. I asked my colleagues on the commission that before we allow these plants to be licensed, we put in a requirement that says before they operate, they must implement all of the lessons that we have learned from the Fukushima accident. Unfortunately, I was not supported in that and I had to oppose the issuance of that license. It's not something that I wanted to do, it's not something that I had ever hoped I would do, but ultimately is what I thought was the right thing to do. Oops. Talk about saved by the bell, sorry about that. <clears throat> and ultimately, we should be thinking about this next generation of plants, if there's going to be a new generation of plants, of meeting this standard to ultimately be able to withstand severe accidents. Why would we not challenge ourselves, a country that prides itself on its ability to advance technology, to advance the limits of safety constantly? Why would we not challenge ourselves to think about nuclear power in a way that doesn't present these kinds of challenges? that doesn't present challenges for severe accidents, that doesn't present challenges for spent fuel disposal? Why is it that we continue to move forward with a technology that has all of these weaknesses and continue to, to pursue it without stopping? Now, at the NRC during the accident, the NRC came up with a number of recommendations of areas that needed to be improved. And at the time of the accident, I was asked in many scenarios, in many situations, what did I think of, of the safety of nuclear power plants? Based on the standards and the regulations of the NRC at the time, I said a very simple thing. I said, based on those standards and what we know and what our, our, our regulations are today, the majority of plants are operating safely. They're operating within those limits. And I made a very important addition to that. And I said, but if we need and we identify areas and, and challenges and things that need to be fixed, then we will make sure that we implement those, those recommendations, that we implement those lessons. And about three months after the accident, the staff at the NRC conducted a very, very thorough and authoritative assessment 
of the weaknesses within our own system. And an analysis that they conducted in about three months, which has really stood the test of time, and I think it's a real testament to the people who, who worked on that and, and conducted this, um, this work. And they essentially came up with 12 high-level recommendations. And there were a number of things in there, like ensuring that we update our regulations for station blackout, that we look at seismic events, we look at flooding events, we look at natural hazards, we look at our emergency response plans. We consider not only the potential for one reactor at a site to have an accident, but the potential for all the reactors at the site to have an accident. They identified issues related to controlling hydrogen, a problem that had thought to have been solved previously. They looked at the need to have better instrumentation on spent fuel pools so that there was not uncertainty, like we saw at the Fukushima Daiichi accident about the condition of the Unit 4 spent fuel pool. So they went through the process of identifying these recommendations and did a tremendously thorough job. But the challenge isn't to identify the, the, the lessons. The challenge is ultimately to implement those. And it is unfortunately, I think, in that area where significant weaknesses and shortcomings remain. And I'm going to give you an example of three issues. Three of these very significant, perhaps some of the most significant lessons that were learned from the Fukushima Daiichi accident and talk to you about where those those lessons are today. The first is the seismic reevaluations that are being done for nuclear power plants in this country. The incident at the Fukushima Daiichi site was fundamentally an earthquake which created a tsunami. To this day, it's unclear exactly how much the earthquake or the tsunami contributed. Clearly, we know the tsunami had a tremendous effect, but there may in fact have been impacts from the earthquake itself. So you would think that this is an issue and especially given the earthquake that we saw in Virginia, <clears throat> this is an issue that would get the utmost attention from a technologically sophisticated industry. But when I was chairman at the NRC, one of the complaints I heard from the industry repeatedly was that there were not enough experts to go back and reassess and reanalyze the seismic impacts on nuclear power plants. My first thinking was, shouldn't we have been doing this all along? Why all of a sudden now do we have to hire all these people to now go out and conduct these assessments and these analyses? Why isn't this something that was being done on a routine and regular basis? Unfortunately, it wasn't. So the latest plan for implementing modifications and taking the best available science about seismic events and how they affect nuclear power plants is to essentially put off this work for another six or seven years. The current schedule, <clears throat> which was recently uh, this fall proposed by the industry and ultimately endorsed by the, the staff of the NRC, was to say that we'll begin a process of making modifications to plants that will be done sometime by December 2016. And those would be for modifications to the facilities that don't require the plants to actually go into an outage. And mind you, these are not modifications based on the best science, the best technical assessment. These are a so-called deterministic assessment, which is basically the kind of approach that's used today. Now, that's just the very first piece, and those are the, I guess you could call those the low-hanging fruit. The real modifications, the changes that could actually impact plant operations, are those things that would require an outage to conduct. The proposal is to have another up to two outages to conduct those, those modifications. Two outages is generally anywhere between uh, uh, um, three and four more years to complete those activities. So we're looking at December 2017 to December 2018 to have those modifications made. Now the truly sophisticated assessments, the best way to understand how seismic events can affect a nuclear power plant some of those assessments won't even be done until 2020, let alone the plant modifications that could come out of this. Now, I bring this up because this should have been one of the most highest priority issues that should have been completed from the, po the post-Fukushima lessons learned. And at the time, when I was chairman, I challenged the industry. I said, we should, we should set a goal. We should all be able to agree on a, on a simple goal. Let's implement all of these lessons within five years. 
No industry wants to spend the next 10 years or more dealing with an accident and the ramifications from an accident that happened in 2011. And I challenge the industry to do that. Unfortunately, that challenge will not be met. There's almost no way that on one of the most important issues, the, the modifications to plans will be made within, within five years for all the facilities. And I think that's, simply, that's just simply unacceptable. Let's take another issue, station blackout, which was known to be the most significant impact from the, law, from the tsunami and the earthquake at the Fukushima site. When that happened, all the electrical power distribution systems were lost and the ability to cool the reactors was essentially completely disabled. The NRC is looking to update its regulations and its requirements, again, a process for just updating the regulations that won't be done until sometime in 2016, more than five years after the accident at Fukushima. And this was identified as the most crucial issue coming out of the accident was the ability to better deal with station blackout events and this complete loss of, of electrical power distribution within, within the system. Now, just taking one other issue, an issue that throughout the rest of the world, including in Japan, has become an obvious issue and an obvious area that currently operating plants need to address, the so-called filtering of hardened vents, the Commission outright rejected making requirements to filter the vents on nuclear power plants. And essentially what this means is in the event of an accident when pressure has to be released to reduce the impact from the accident, that the material that's released would be scrubbed of radioactive contamination, a way to further reduce the contamination around the site and to people off-site from the reactor. So unfortunately, what we see is a process in which delay <coughs> continues to be used instead of actual solutions to problems from an industry that claims it is incredibly technologically advanced, that it is incredibly focused on safety. Uh, the time that it will take to try and fully implement these lessons is simply staggering. And I think something that is, is completely unacceptable. But so let's look at where we are in the United States and in Japan today. At Fukushima Daiichi, there continues to be challenges with cleanup and water management at the site. As Prime Minister Khan talked about, there is an issue with groundwater contamination. So while the immediate accident is over, the challenges from this accident continue. And I think to some extent, the good thing that has come out of some of the recent reports and the recent contamination events has been a renewed focus on this, on this tragedy in Japan. A renewed focus on the need to have sufficient and exhaustive oversight of the utility, TEPCO, that not only created the accident, but ultimately has the responsibility to clean it up. The government has stepped in to provide more resources to ultimately deal with these issues, but make no mistake that they will not be easily solved. For any of you who've ever had a home or lived in an apartment that had water leaks, you know water has a way of finding its way into almost anything. And water will find its way into the reactor site for some time, and as long as there's a significant source of contamination there, that will ultimately lead to continued contamination of the sea and the groundwater around the site. But ultimately, the international credibility of the Japanese nuclear industry is at stake, and with that, the credibility of the Japanese economy as a whole. And as Prime Minister Khan said, there is no other electricity source, no other technology that we have that can create these kinds of economy-wide impacts that can challenge the economy of an entire nation. <clears throat> if we look to the United States, the challenges are somewhat different. Here in the United States, economics continue to be a major factor in driving the decisions about nuclear power plants, but something very unique has happened over the last several years. We have seen a number of plants that have either announced or have actually closed at a time in which the industry was proclaiming itself to be in the verge of a nuclear renaissance, we're in fact seeing the number of nuclear power plants actually decrease for the first time in a long time. Oyster Creek is planned to shut down in 2019. Kiwani, a plant in Wisconsin, was not able to be bought and, and shut down. 
Vermont Yankee uh, w announced it will shut down next year. And of course, the ongoing fight with Indian Point will perhaps lead to the same situation. <clears throat> But what's perhaps more concerning is the fact that there have been two plants that have actually shut down permanently because of, ultimately, because of safety issues. The two units at St. Onofre experienced a seam generator tube rupture that turned out to be a, 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 a creation of, of a number of, of different factors, but ultimately it was a poor design, and a poor design that led to, to extremely expensive pieces of equipment being unable to perform their function properly and leading to a small radiation leak. And as a result of that safety challenge and the inability to properly analyze and understand exactly what happened and propose an acceptable solution, those plants were forced to shut down. A plant in Florida at the Crystal River site shut down because they were unable to properly repair damage to the concrete containment building that contains the reactor. Now, when you think about this, this is three reactors from a fleet of about 100 reactors. What industry would tolerate the failure of 3% of its assets in such a way and still consider itself to be a viable industry in any sector of the United States economy? These are assets that are worth, if nothing else, billions and billions of dollars that, because of safety challenges, had to be shut down. If that doesn't tell us something, about this technology, I'm not sure what will. <clears throat> so as we look here to the future, in Japan, because of the leadership of Prime Minister Khan, they are beginning to look at alternatives to nuclear. They are dealing with a situation in which their nuclear power plants have been shut down. And they're forced to figure out how they can cope and how they can ultimately manage. And because of his leadership, they will ultimately figure out a way to do that that allows for Japan to meet its goals and meet its, its, its desires to address climate change and carbon emissions in a way that is done, hopefully, without nuclear power as well. But there will be, for decades, a cleanup activity at the site at Fukushima. There will be the water management issues. There will be the removal of spent fuel pool. There will be decontamination of communities in the hopes that some people may be able to return to their communities. But after years and years and years, it's hard for a community to be brought back together. There will be the removal of the melted fuel, or perhaps the inability to remove the fuel and the need to simply leave it in place. And then ultimately, some type of decommissioning of these reactors, a process that will take probably my entire life to finally be completed. This is a significant, a significant challenge and one that cannot be forgotten and cannot be lost. <clears throat> In the United States, when we think about the future, I'm reminded of a speech that I gave many years ago in which I talked about the future of nuclear power. And at the time, I proposed that there were two futures. There was a future in which there was a thriving industry because safety truly became the number one priority for the industry because they looked at novel and new ways to deal with severe accidents, to reduce not only the possibility, but to completely eliminate the possibility of severe accidents. But the management of spent fuel in the long term had been solved and resolved, and the industry was able to move forward in a thriving way with a new generation of bright young people willing to pursue this technology because it truly was beneficial. The other alternative was a future in which the industry would be declining where the focus would be more on decommissioning and trying to sustain an industry in which people no longer saw it had a future and the best and brightest no longer went in to pursue this technology and pursued other alternatives. This is a future in which a few plants may be built, but those plants wouldn't necessarily have the kind of support they need to operate efficiently and effectively because the industry would slowly be turning to other areas. Ultimately, I felt it was up to the industry to decide which path that they were going to follow. And I think if you look today, the future is clearly on that second path. It is clearly on an industry that is declining. <clears throat> but with that comes tremendous challenges. 
With that comes the need to have a greater emphasis and a greater focus on safety than ever before. Because as the industry contracts and as resources get more constrained and more challenged, it becomes even more imperative to continue to ensure that these plants that are out there now continue to operate without having a severe accident like the one that we saw. So ultimately, when we look to the future, I think we have to recognize the challenges with nuclear power. There are promises from nuclear power, but there certainly are challenges. And I think we have to recognize that we should challenge ourselves to do better, that this is an expensive technology that always has the risk for these kinds of severe accidents. And we have to ask ourselves if we cannot do better, if we cannot figure out a better way in 10, 20, or 30 years to generate electricity. I believe we can. I believe in this country, we, when we present ourselves with these kinds of challenges, we're able to meet them. And so as we look to the future, I'm reminded of the country that invented the light bulb. I think we can do better. We can invent a new way to power those light bulbs. We can invent a new way to light our homes and provide for all our electronic devices that are such a necessity for us these days in a way that doesn't pose the risk of severe contamination of land around nuclear power plants or the displacement of hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of people from their homes for an extended period of time. That to me is the future that I think we should be striving for and one that I think we can meet. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Well, Indian, Indian Point presents an interesting dichotomy. Uh, the NRC says that the chance of a nuclear accident is about one in a million. Um, with 40, uh, 400 operating nuclear reactors, if you put a million in the numerator and 400 in the denominator, you wound up with an accident about every 2,500 years. So from the time the Acropolis was built until now, there would be one nuclear accident using those numbers. Uh, the, the NRC uses a, a technique called probabilistic risk assessment to come up with that number, PRA. I like to refer to it as prey. Um, an old plant like, like Indian Point, um, interestingly, uses data from younger plants to determine whether moving forward or not it will be safe. That's sort of like my doctor telling me that uh, you know I'll live to uh, 120 because he's basing his analysis on 25-year-olds. The, um, um, but if we use the NRC's methodology, the chance of three meltdowns or one in the million times one in the million times one in the million, uh, there's a lot of zeros there, 18 zeros of the chance of three, but yet it happened. And I think that's what happened, that the lesson of real life disagrees with the, uh, the lessons of, uh, uh, of the PRA. If you look at the last 35 years, we've had five meltdowns. We've had Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and three meltdowns of Fukushima. So if you put 35 in the numerator and five in the denominator, you come up with an accident about every seven years. Well, clearly, that's a lot different than once in every 2,500 years. My apologies, by the way, to Windscale and Santa Susana and about a dozen other meltdowns that occurred before Three Mile Island in that analysis. Um, so policymakers and business interests ignore history and focus on the probabilistic risk assessment as they make the decisions to relicense Indian Point moving forward. While demanding taxpayer dollars to pay for accident insurance, those same policymakers, whether they're politicians, regulators, or members of the business community, seem to really believe in their heart of hearts that a nuclear accident can't happen at Indian Point. Now, when someone's brain reasons a way to justify support for something you want to be true, psychologists call that motivated reasoning. Now, there's a lot of motivated reasoning at the NRC and at policymakers here in New York State about why Indian Point should be allowed to move forward. Recently, I testified up in Canada at, a, uh, at the hearing of uh, the Canadian uh, Nuclear Safety Commission uh, on the Pickering nuclear reactors. They're, um, they're old, they were scheduled to be shut down, and they were asking for a license extension. Pickering has, has eight nuclear reactors 20 miles from downtown Toronto. At the hearings, speaker after speaker implored the CNSB to keep these aged nuclear plants running because they paid their taxes and because they were a major employer. I heard speaker after speaker say that the people who worked at these plants were great people. They were on the school board, they coached the soccer team, they sang in the church choir. The logic seemed to be that if you have nice people running your plant, it will be safe. <laughs> the situation reminds me a little bit of Garrison Keillor and Lake Wobegon, where he says all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Every town I visit that, owns a, that has a nuclear power plant, Adam, believes that their nuclear plant is better than average. Well, if history has taught us anything, it's that nuclear accidents happen despite the best intentions of the men and women who work at them. I knew the operators at Three Mile Island. I had people working for me uh, during the recovery efforts on the, on the plant site. Those operators were safety conscious as anyone. They lived in the community. Their homes were just down the street, and yet an accident happened. This is a technology that can have 40 good years to be wiped out by one bad day. After the Chernobyl accident, I got to know some of the operators at Chernobyl. They were brilliant engineers, and they were very safety conscious. They and their families lived right near the reactors. 
and yet an accident happened. And this is a technology that can have 40 good years and one bad day. Then after I wrote my book, Fukushima Daiichi, The Truth in the Future, I uh, got to know some of the operators at, uh, at Fukushima. And again, their families lived right down the street. They were conscientious. They were safety, safety conscious. They knew how their plant worked like, like a book. They understood it completely. And yet the accident happened. 40 good years and one very bad day. Well, policymakers seem to be take, taking the front part of that sentence, 40 good years, to heart. But they're not taking the back part of that sentence, the one bad day part, to heart. Companies like Energy claim their plants are safe. What exactly does that mean? Well, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in congressional hearings admitted that it reviews about 5% of the material in the analysis that goes into a nuclear power plant. And they check off the boxes that that paperwork is actually existed. But what Energy doesn't tell you is that the commissioners at the NRC are vetted by the industry's lobbying group called NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute, before Congress is allowed to vote on them. And this same lobbying group works with the NRC Commission and the staff as they write the regulations that a nuclear plant is designed to work under. So what that means is that safe to someone like Energy in Indian Point means that Indian Point can comply with the minimum acceptable standard established by a compliant regulator. Well, let's talk about a couple of specific items here um, about the corporations that own these plants. Um, the first is the, uh, the NRC, about 15 years ago, allowed nuclear plants to become limited liability corporations. Now, what that means is that a limited liability corporation is separate from the entity to which it reports. So we always talk about energy owning Indian Point or Vermont Yankee or Pilgrim. Each of those plants is its own limited liability corporation. So what does that mean? That means that if Indian Point 2, which is a separate limited liability corporation from Indian Point 3, if Indian Point 2 had an accident and released radiation, it could be declared bankrupt, and Indian Point 3 would not be on the hook for that liability. Now, Entergy wouldn't do that, would they? <laughs> you need only to look at Entergy's behavior after Katrina to see that they have, in fact, already behaved that way. After Katrina, while the city was bailing itself out, Entergy New Orleans, the, the power company that provides power to New Orleans, is a limited liability corporation. It declared bankruptcy. The corporation was making billions but the entity that controlled New Orleans declared bankruptcy. And what happened then was that the United States government moved cash that was destined for poor, uh, poor families within um, New Orleans through the Community Development Block Grant Program and transferred it over to Entergy. And Entergy gave its executives bonuses. So what are the conditions like inside these old 40-year-old plants up the Hudson River? Two panels, one was sponsored by Entergy itself. In 2008, Entergy brought in 12 experts from around the world, handpicked, their experts. And, and here's what they had to say about the condition of Indian Point. Quote, the physical condition of the plant is visibly deficient. The care and maintenance of some of the plant systems and structures do not meet the standards of high-performing plants. It is the panel's view that the maintenance and preservation of non-critical plant systems, equipment, and structures is important because it communicates to employees and to the public alike the owner and operator's commitment to professionalism. That's their own group said that, 2008. Well, Peter and I were on a panel in Vermont and in 2010, we came to a very similar conclusion on Vermont Yankee. Here's what we said. The issue of inadequate application of resources, when you're on a panel that, that you have to use fancy language, that means that they're not spending enough money. 
The issue of inadequate application of resources takes on heightened importance as Entergy's status as an aging plant. Over the remainder of Entergy's operating life, the possibility of a shutdown within a few years can never be ruled out and will become a near certainty at some point. If the events of the last couple of years are any guide, Entergy has a tendency to focus expenditure on safety systems and systems obvious of obvious reliability importance while withholding resources from systems it deems secondary to reliability. Quote, limited resource allocation for non-safety systems might be systemic within Entergy. What did Entergy do two months ago? They cut their staff by 5%. So in spite of two panels telling Entergy that they're not spending enough money, Entergy's reaction is to cut its staff by another 5%. Well, you might ask, what's the NRC doing about that? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Neil Sheehan, the public relations person at Entergy said, and here's his quote, the NRC has the ability to determine whether there are any adverse impacts through our reactor oversight process. If we observe any negative trends via inspection findings or performance indicators, we could determine if there's any linkage to human resource changes. Well, to me, what that means is that after an accident in Indian Point, they could go in and ultimately determine that they didn't have a big enough staff, but only after the accident. It's a matter that's systemic through the nuclear industry right now. Uh, because of declining prices, the um, reaction in, to make a profit is to cut your staff. It happened at Millstone, just over in Connecticut, where the operator of that plant said that its staff was higher than industry standards at that two-unit site. They had more people than the average two-unit site. So the NRC allowed them to reduce their staff. Well, think about that. An average, if you're higher than average and the NRC lets you come down to average, if you're lower than average, you would think the NRC would force you up. It didn't happen. It's a one-way ratchet. It only pushes staffs down and down and down. So as power plants are getting older, the staffs are getting smaller. It's a major concern. Well, every day at Fairwinds, uh, we, get, we get emails saying, it can't possibly be that the American plants are as bad as the uh, uh, Fukushima Daiichi. And I thought I'd look briefly at the condition of Indian Point and compare it to Daiichi. And in many ways, Indian Point is actually worse than Fukushima Daiichi was the day before the accident. <laughs> the first issue, as was alluded to already, is emergency planning with a population center as close as New York City is to Indian Point. You know, Tokyo was uh, 120 miles away from Fukushima Daiichi. Indian Point is 26 miles up the road. Also, the Japanese were the best at emergency planning in the world. They really took emergency planning seriously. And yet the entire emergency planning system collapsed in the, in the, as a consequence of a severe accident where all the safety systems collapsed. If the Japanese couldn't do emergency planning right, I don't think anybody in the world can. The, the second thing is the condition of the spent fuel pool. Indian Point has five times more nuclear fuel in its spent fuel pool than does Daiichi. Indian Point has the equivalent of every bomb that was ever fired above ground in the above ground testing phases. That much radiation is in the pools at Indian Point and is not being moved to dry cask storage. The Japanese moved a lot of fuel to dry cask storage. The Japanese had about seven years of nuclear fuel in Daiichi whereas Indian Point has over 30. The, the third thing is the, um, is we all know that the, the common uh, view of the accident is that um, the, the Daiichi's accident was caused by an earthquake followed by a tsunami. But really what happened was this, the earthquake knocked down the power lines that fed the plant. And so that's called the loss of offsite power. Then the tsunami came in and wiped out the cooling pumps along the water. It also wiped out the diesels. 
But even if the diesels had not been wiped out, the cooling pumps along the water were. That's called the loss of the ultimate heat sink because you need that water to cool your diesels. So that creates something that, that Chairman Yasko talked about was this station blackout. And a nuclear plant is designed to withstand that for about four to eight hours. Now, can that happen at Indian Point? The answer is yes. Two people dedicated to dying as terrorists could cause a loss of offsite power by shooting the, the transmission lines and also drive a, a high powered boat with explosives into the intake structure, which could cause a loss of the ultimate heat sink. Two terrorists could create the same problem that we experienced at Fukushima Daiichi. I wrote about this two years ago in my book, but other people have been talking about this for years, and the NRC has done nothing to prevent the accident from getting any worse. Lastly on my list is earthquake frequency. You know, we always think of earthquakes as happening on the West Coast, but Indian Point has the worst um, core damage frequency. It's a, it's, a, it's a number designed to show how likely it is that the nuclear reactor core will be damaged in the event of an earthquake of any power plant in the country. And on top of that, the accident, the, the earthquake at North Anna shows us that earthquakes are a lot more likely to happen than we've ever anticipated. North Anna down in Virginia was uh, a Richter 6. And North Anna was designed to withstand a Richter 6. But everybody thought that Richter 6 would occur about once every thousand years. It happened in 30 years, which tells me that the probability of something bigger needs to be evaluated, that the plants need to be stronger. And oh, by the way, Indian Point is a mile away from an earthquake fault that hadn't been identified in the 60s and could cause an earthquake that its systems would not be capable of withstanding. Well, let me sum this up. Um, it's easy for the nuclear industry to, um, to allow arrogance and hubris to set in when you look at the sheer size of a nuclear power plant. Um, Paul mentioned I went to RPI up in Troy, New York and graduated in 72 while Indian Point was being built. And the nuclear department at RPI used to drive down to Indian Point and we watched Indian Point being built. The, um, uh, both then and now, it's an impressive building. But nobody ever asked, why does it have to be impressive? What's inside those plants that requires such, a such an impressive structure in the first place? Well, Daiichi, the accident of Fukushima Daiichi, has shown us that nuclear power systems can fail with catastrophic results. And we need to ask, should we build using such an uncontrollable and unmanageable technology? The forces in these plants are enormous, and they must always be controlled 24-7, 365. Well, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and now Fukushima Daiichi have shown just how impossible it is to control an accident, to, to control a reaction 24-7, 365. One operator error, one significant weather event, one earthquake, or one terrorist attack, and all of New York City will face that one bad day. And like Japan, it will be one sad day. Thank you. Arnie Gunderson, thank you. Uh, in an attempt to be a full service moderator, I'm gonna provide some footnotes for you. Uh, reports prepared not by uh, Riverkeeper or any other advocacy organization, but groups like uh, the National Academy of Sciences in 2006, finding a significant risk of terrorism associated with nuclear plants, including Indian Point, especially with regard to spent fuel a report commissioned by Governor Pataki, performed by James Lee Witt, a former head of FEMA in 2002, indicating issues with Indian Point's evacuation planning. A study in 2013 by the Government Accountability Office indicating that all of our plants have underestimated the risk of evacuations beyond the 10-mile zone. 
Back in 2010, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did the math on the risk of meltdown uh, in reactors in the United States and found that the greatest risk of meltdown due to earthquake was at one of the two Indian Point reactors. 2013, again, the University of Texas doing a study commissioned by the Defense Department finding inadequate preparations for terrorism at all of our nuclear plants and especially at plants like Indian Point with river access. So that having been said, we're coming down the home stretch. We have two speakers, and our next speaker is Peter A. Bradford, former member of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and former chair of the Maine and New York Utility Regulatory Commissions. Uh, Peter served on the NRC during the Three Mile Island nuclear accident. Uh, he currently teaches energy policy at the, and law at the Vermont Law School and has taught at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Mr. Bradford has written extensively on the failure of the nuclear renaissance and the reasons that nuclear power is not a magic bullet answer to climate change. Please welcome Peter Bradford. Thanks very much, Paul. I'm going to supplement that introduction uh, in a moment, but first I have to apologize. I didn't get the memo uh, that this was a, such an avant-garde post-PowerPoint panel, and uh, so unable to ski slalom without the gates, I'm uh, going to uh, be a little more old-fashioned. Um, and speaking of old-fashioned, the last time I was uh, in this building um, was a couple of years after the Indian Point Units 2 and 3 opened. Uh, as it happens, my two of my children grew up a couple of blocks from here. And I had come to watch my daughter in 1976 play the role of Alice in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Um, uh, I was at the time on the NRC, so I guess it must have been 1977. Um, I didn't realize how much she and I had in common uh, at that time. <laughs> and one other uh, biographical note, I, uh, before all that, uh, back closer to the time that Indian Point One um, opened, uh, I was actually a Nader's Raider uh, in the summer of 1968. It was my first job out of law school. Well, job, if, uh, if you take job to mean paid, then actually it wasn't. Uh, uh, the insights that I garnered from Ralph on, on that occasion with regard to the workings of the regulatory process have stood me in very good stead ever since, and this is my first chance to acknowledge that publicly in his presence, and I wanted to do so. <laughs> it, it sometimes happens that when I'm a witness in a legal proceeding and, and being deposed by nuclear industry lawyers, uh, uh, usually late in the process when perhaps they think I'm a little fatigued, they'll say. Uh, now, is it true, Mr. Bradford, that at one time you worked for Ralph Nader? Uh, <laughs> in a tone that suggests that they've discovered a close tie between me and Karl Marx. Um, <laughs> and uh, because in a deep position they can't really control how you meander about in your answer, um, I've developed a, a response that goes somewhat as follows. If, yes, uh, we were an interesting group. Um, it was Ed Cox who married Tricia Nixon and is now the New York State Republican chair. Um, Will Taft, who was the Under Secretary of Defense in the Reagan administration and the legal advisor to Colin Powell in George W. Bush's administration. Judy Arene, who was the dean of the law, Georgetown Law School, uh, and a couple of other law professors. So no wonder you're one of the 100 most influential uh, people. You've been 
subversively training the establishment for <laughs> several decades now, and, and nobody's really noticed it. Uh, well, look, I, uh, it's time I got down to business. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure how to control the PowerPoints, but if I say next, will somebody hit a button? Okay, next. Um, the first uh, PowerPoint is intended just to tell you where we're going. There are three points that I'm going to make, and the rest of the presentation is the facts and, and the reasoning. But the conclusions that I uh, would like to leave you with is that there's some unfinished business with regard to assessing shortcomings in U.S. nuclear regulation uh, as a result of uh, that was shown by the uh, accident at Fukushima. And there's really nothing underway that would suggest that uh, that underlying uh, shortcomings are going to be remedied. Um, second, uh, you may remember that about a decade ago, there began to be a lot of talk about something called the nuclear renaissance in the US. And as we'll see, that's fallen pretty well on its face. Um, and no one's doing a root cause analysis of why we went through the nuclear renaissance bubble um, and uh, what uh, we ought to learn from, uh, from that experience either. And finally, the one argument that nuclear proponents still have that has a certain renaissance, uh, certain resonance in environmental circles is that we have to have new reactors, we have to have nuclear power as an essential part of any strategy uh, against climate change. Um, uh, and I'm going to give you a, a, a quick overview of, of why that claim to uh, is, is not valid. Uh, it has some uh, force with regard to the fleet of existing re reactors. Uh, shutting them all at once would be a good deal more chaotic than a planned uh, and uh, uh, gradual phase out. And in fact, that was the conclusion of the National Academy panel on alternatives to Indian Point uh, that was done seven or so years ago. Uh, next slide, please. So as to the first of those points, the, uh, the fact that we've yet to do a, uh, uh, a root cause analysis with regard to the shortcomings in uh, the US regulatory process that were shown uh, by the Fukushima accident, which after all occurred in a type of plant that's in widespread use in the US um, as well. It intrigues me to compare the process that the U.S. went through after Three Mile Island, a far less serious accident than Fukushima by any measure. It was an accident that was essentially over in five days. Um, uh, but after it ended, uh, all of the Babcock and Wilcox reactors were closed for several months in order to be sure that operator training was done and analysis uh, of that design was undertaken to show that uh, any repeat of what happened at Three Mile Island could be, uh, uh, the possibility that, that could be eliminated. And unit one at Three Mile Island, uh, the other undamaged unit, remained closed for five years before uh, the NRC concluded that the company was uh, capable of, of operating that unit safely. Um, the NRC also did not license, did not issue any further operating licenses or construction permits. In fact, it was never to issue another construction permit, um, although not uh, because it put a moratorium on them. But it didn't issue any operating licenses either for a period of 18 months while it uh, undertook to learn the lessons of Three Mile Island. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in addition to that, we had a presidential commission, uh, the Kemeny Commission, appointed by President Carter. The NRC set up its own 
special inquiry group, an outside law firm uh, with complete independence to examine the regulatory process and to ask the fundamental questions about it. And by root cause analysis, I mean not just what are the shortcomings in terms of reactor design and operating practices, but how did they get there? Um, what is it about the regulatory process uh, that uh, allowed these shortcomings to creep in or prevented their being fixed? Now, neither the Kemeny Commission nor the NRC's own special inquiry group necessarily got all the right answers, but they were charged with going after the root causes in a way that just hasn't happened with regard to U.S. regulation in the wake of uh, Fukushima, where the NRC has certainly undertaken, as Greg noted, very serious analyses of the technical shortcomings of particular reactor designs. But as I'll show in a minute, it seems to me hasn't really asked, and the Congress hasn't really asked, the questions about how these shortcomings came to be, how some of them uh, persisted in the face of efforts to point them out over many years. In addition to those studies, Congress undertook major investigations of Three Mile Island, and the NRC itself promulgated an 180 action item, 180 item action plan. The next slide, please. Um, and finally, in what seems a very radical, uh, let's see, we, next slide. Hmm. Anybody home? Oh, don't, okay, we are on the next slide. Uh, it, it, so it, what seems a particularly radical step by today's uh, congressional oversight standards, the groups that looked at the NRC said, you know, one of the problems with this agency is that it's not particularly responsive to public concerns. One of the pro proposals to remedy it was that the NRC should set up a public counsel's office to assist the public in voicing its concerns. Another proposal was that financial assistance be provided to intervener groups. The Congress stepped in and prohibited, in fact, either uh, of those measures. And in recent years, the NRC, not under Greg's auspices, but uh, before he became a commissioner, went in the opposite direction and substantially reduced the uh, scope of public participation and involvement in uh, NRC processes. Um, so, uh, let's see, next. The, uh, um, so it's not that the NRC hasn't taken a hard look at the uh, technical shortcomings, but when you look at some of the types of issues that outside groups have raised, uh, like the Seven Scientists paper on spent fuel storage um, and spent fuel management, an issue that was strongly implicated in the uh, in the Fukushima accident as well. What you find is that the commission in fact refused to consider that uh, petition and in fact even uh, undertook to delay the uh, release of the National Academy of Sciences review of, uh, of its spent fuel management practices. And there's quite a history of congressional oversight in recent years, uh, oversight I think one has to say that's in part, substantial part, prompted by the campaign contributions of the nuclear industry, being directed very much in the direction of why can't you issue licenses faster? Um, why can't you lighten up on your regulation of the nuclear industry? Very rarely in the direction of why can't you uh, uh, be more vigilant in, in pursuit of, of safety concerns? But those kinds of questions simply uh, haven't been asked or looked into as part of uh, the follow-up to um, uh, the events at Fukushima. Um, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, gonna get whiplash. Uh, so 
um, one more fact about Three Mile Island, and I just want to make this point in the context of transitioning from accident investigations more into the economic circumstances of the, uh, of the industry. Um, the industry in recent years has tended to say that the reason the first burst of nuclear construction in the U.S. came to a halt was because of the accident at Three Mile Island, because of overreaction by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, because of environmental interveners uh, making too much of a fuss and raising the costs of nuclear power too high. But the fact is that uh, the nuclear industry was in serious trouble before the accident at Three Mile Island. There were, had already been a substantial number of plant cancellations, cost overruns. Uh, and the real issues were the rising costs of reactors, the fact that electricity demand had begun to decline in the late 70s. Um, even then, there were cheaper alternatives. Uh, and in particular, in the late 70s, we had the emergence of competitive power procurement in the US. Uh, and uh, once competitive power procurement processes came into play, new, new nuclear reactors uh, never even bid. Now, this theme of attributing the failure of a hope for a nuclear boom uh, to a particular accident is one we're going to see again in the context of, uh, of Fukushima. So it's an important one to understand. Next slide, please. Um, now, uh, this year has been a particularly significant and frustrating one for the nuclear industry. It's the first year since 1998 in which operating nuclear reactors uh, have closed, and, and uh, Greg already named them, so uh, I'll skip over the, the list, which is in the, the first bullet. Um, at the same time, there are five plants that are being built uh, in the South, all under laws that put all the economic risk uh, on the customers. Um, but in addition to the five plant cancellations, up rates, that is increases in the output of nuclear plants through uh, design modifications, have also been canceled, uh, again, because they're too expensive, and that hasn't happened previously. Um, the older reactors, in, uh, the fact that reactors are, are aging, that repairs are, that some of them need are expensive, uh, that the alternatives keep getting cheaper, and that we don't have a national climate policy are all contributing factors. Uh, but we have a situation now in which not only has the Renaissance collapsed, we're not building any new plants, but for the first time, we're actually seeing substantial reductions in the number and the potential output of the operating units. Uh, and while the industry would like to say, well, this is Fukushima, it'll pass, uh, and we'll be able to get back to normal, the fact is that like Three Mile Island, it's not the product of the accident. It's a product of unfavorable underlying nuclear economics. Um, and the situation isn't restricted to the U.S. If I, next slide. So uh, this slide is taken from the World Nuclear Industry Status Report, which is an extremely useful publication for those of you who are interested in nuclear data worldwide. And what it's showing you that I want to emphasize in the context of the discussion of climate change that I'll get to uh, in a minute, is that while the nuclear renaissance was argued to be part of a, the beginning of a necessary ramp up in nuclear plant output in order to uh, make nuclear power a, a big part of an anti-climate change strategy, what's actually happened in the 10 years that we have been talking about a nuclear renaissance is that the output of our of the world's nuclear fleet is lower than it was 10 years ago. Uh, not by a lot, but 
during a time when for nuclear power to be a useful contributor, it had to have in begun to increase substantially. What it's actually done is to decline, both as a percentage of world energy uh, usage, that's the orange line, uh, sorry, not usage, but production, and in absolute terms, which are the bars. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so a word more about the uh, non-existent nuclear renaissance. Congress passed a tremendous package of incentives in 2005, um, and it triggered a rush of 18 applications uh, for 30, 31 actually reactors by the end of 2008 at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Next slide. So what's happened to those 31 reactors? Well, the truth is none of them can be built without massive government support. The package included loan guarantees that shift the risk uh, from investors and lenders to taxpayers, um, and also state rate-making policies that uh, provide, that allow uh, the utilities to collect capital from customers years before the plant is completed. And it's those policies that are allowing the five plants that are being built in the U.S. to go forward. But only half a dozen states have adopted policies like that, so it can't be the basis for a widespread construction boom around the country. And worse still from the industry standpoint, events in North Florida have made clear just how badly these arrangements can turn out for customers. Because there, both the Crystal River plant, which was being upgraded pursuant to these rate-making policies, and the Levy County plants, two units, that were going through the licensing process as a result of them, had been canceled. But they weren't canceled until more than a billion dollars had been collected with more to come from Florida customers. So Florida customers are out a billion dollars with no prospect of any uh, gain in uh, electricity output from these uh, uh, rate-making strategies that are an, an essential part of new nuclear construction. Next slide, please. Um, I want to come back now to the Fukushima accident, but I want to put it in a bit more of an economic context than a health and safety context. What I don't want to do is go down this entire list because we don't have time for that. But the important point to understand is that Fukushima wasn't just a shock to the nuclear system in health and safety terms. It represented a fundamental undermining of a great many of the assumptions on which the regulatory systems were, were built. But then if we go on to the next slide, you can see also that uh, it entailed a number of different types of economic shock and perception shock. And as others have already said, uh, even if one doesn't take into account the health and safety impacts, just the fact of the evacuation of 100,000 or more people, many of whom haven't been able to return home, many of whom won't be able to return home for years, has people around reactor sites all over the world thinking what how would happen if that happened here. And also the fact that the accident just isn't really over, that every week we see further headlines of the difficulties that Japan is having in managing the, uh, uh, the water and the, the cleanup. Um, indicate that the consequences of a nuclear accident are very large even if the health and safety uh, concerns are put to one side, which of course they can't be. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, so now, to roll the economic uh, conclusions together, you have a situation in which new nuclear is likely to cost in the range of 12 to 20 cents. You can cut the price but not the cost by these federal subsidies because they shift aspects of the price out of the, uh, what has to be collected from the customers. Um, uh, and at the same time, you have a situation in which natural gas continues to fall in price 
and become more and more available in, as to quantity. And the current forecasts are that it's not going to rise to anywhere near 12 to 20 cents any time in the next 20 uh, to 25 years. Energy efficiency is available in large amounts. Renewables are falling uh, in price. New nuclear isn't, hasn't continued to rise, but it isn't falling either. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as to the operating reactors, um, most of them can probably still compete, but they're going to close over the next couple of decades for economic reasons. We've yet to see a, a reactor close in the U.S., and quite a few have, because it reached the end of its license life. Uh, that's, that's not what closes them. But as the mar economic margins narrow, the pressure on safety increases. Uh, as the plants get older, their economics get worse. Uh, it gets harder to justify major capital investments with fewer years to recover them. Uh, you can make this system work for them if you're in a region where the rates are regulated by a commission that can put all the costs in rate base. But if you're in a region like the Northeast and New York where the prices have to be recovered in power markets uh, and can't be passed on by friendly regulators, these plants are going to be under increasing economic pressure, and that has both safety and uh, uh, economic implications for their future. Um, I want to skip the next slide just in the, well, actually, don't skip it. I'll put the next slide up, and we'll spend about four seconds on it. Uh, in Japan, as the prime minister indicated, the uh, uh, the Japanese have gotten by without much nuclear power at all in the years since the Fukushima accident. But as you can see, the price they're paying for natural gas is much higher than in the U.S., where the blue line uh, indicates where nuclear power's primary competitor comes from. My conjecture is that the price in Japan uh, is going to fall, although perhaps not all the way. Uh, uh, to ours, but you can see why uh, nuclear power in the U.S. is under extreme economic uh, uh, pressure and is likely to remain so because there are no projections that really show that price going up substantially in the decades um, ahead. Next slide, please. So now to put this economic picture in the context of the argument that you have to have nuclear power to fight climate change. Uh, I want to talk about it a little bit in the context of the so-called bacala sokolow wedge analysis, which we'll get to in a second. But there's a general agreement that you have to make a pretty heroic effort in terms of building nuclear plants to put even a small dent in the overall climate change problem. That is to get a 10% greenhouse gas reduction you have to triple the number of reactors worldwide, which is currently in the range of 430, 440. And of course, to do that, you'd have to build fuel enrichment and waste repositories to handle uh, the fuel needs and the waste needs of those plants. But as we saw on the earlier slide, there hasn't been, we haven't seen the kind of ramping up that would suggest that anything like that's underway. In fact, what we've seen is a decline while well, the climate change problem has gotten increasingly urgent. Next slide, please. So this is the bacala sokolow wedge piece, and it's not up there because we're going to go through each slice of that pie. But the fundamental proposition that I want to leave you with is that there are a lot, and it's, uh, this was the work of a couple of Princeton economists about seven years ago, and it's really more of a thought exercise than a prediction about the future. There are a lot of roughly equal ways to attack climate change. And depending on how much CO2 or greenhouse gas reduction you want to get, you have to resort to more and more of those wedges. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, any one of the wedges um, will have the following impact. It prevents a billion tons of carbon every year uh, by 2054. They each involve the scaling up of technologies that already exist. Um, and seven of them 
roughly would get you to 500 parts in, per million more, obviously, if the target is going to be 350. Uh, next slide. So uh, about the wedges, three of them are energy efficiency based, four of them are alternative transportation, two involved enhanced carbon sinks, and four involved decarbonizing electric power generation. And one of those four is nuclear. Um, but again, that nuclear wedge, next slide please, uh, involves a huge increase in the current nuclear fleet. So to get the 10% or so of the uh, climate reduction that uh, nuclear can afford, you're talking about building seven to 900 new plants plus replacing the entire existing fleet. Uh, and that assumes that nuclear replaces only coal. If it replaces lower CO2 emitters like gas and hydro, you need more. So it's prodigiously difficult and it's prodigiously expensive. And because nuclear takes so long, uh, it's not gonna have any impact at all between now and 2020 or 2025 when people are really looking to make a, a CO2 problem turn around. Um, let me just quickly illustrate within the electric power sector how implausible that scenario is by turning to the next slide, which is Exelon. This, so this isn't Greenpeace. This isn't me. It's not Amory Levin. This is the largest operator of nuclear power plants in the U.S., indicating as of a couple of years ago what it thought its best low-carbon options in the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, power pool were. Uh, and again, we, don't, we won't go through each of those blocks, but just notice that new nuclear is that blue bar on your far right. So all of the choices to the left of that are better economic choices. They include energy efficiency, they include coal to gas conversions, they include that gray block is nuclear uprates but Exelon is one of the companies that's been canceling its nuclear uprates. So even the nuclear uprates are proving to be too expensive compared to the other choices, often gas-based choices, that they see as being available to them. Um, next slide, please. So what we're left with is the question of how to choose among these options in a, a rational way, that is, how not to succumb to the blandishments that say, well, we just have to bet a lot of money on nuclear, like it or not, because otherwise we're choosing to burn fossil fuels and heat up uh, the climate. Um, and it's, uh, to me, the starting point in a, much, in a system of more rational choice has to be in the creation of markets that put a price on carbon. Um, that's a debate that we just don't have time to go into in, in detail today, but without it, we're going to be constantly dealing with a process in which different industries go to Washington and urge their own preferred outcomes. And nuclear is much more successful in Washington traditionally than they have been uh, in the marketplace. Um, next slide. So one of the... Uh, <laughs> The, the, and this is actually my last slide. So uh, the uh, argument one hears often is, well, the strategy we have to pursue is all of the above. Um, that uh, the problem of climate change is so urgent that we just have to throw everything at it. Well, think about that. That's not how we solve problems. We don't, for example, go after world hunger by placing a big bet on caviar. Um, and there's a fundamental logical economic reason for that, which is that if you bet on your most expensive options, you're not going to be able to buy enough of what it is that you need. Uh, and that's the, the reason why it seems to me that a heavy bet on new nuclear uh, that in particular the environmental communities, those in the environmental community who are tempted by the prospect that nuclear power is low carbon, um, 
are barking up a wrong tree and need to reevaluate how they think about choosing among the low carbon options that are available to us. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we've heard a lot about lessons learned. We've also heard a lot about uh, the myths of nuclear power. There is a very important myth about nuclear power that applies to our situation here, and that is the myth that the relicensing of Indian Point is a foregone conclusion. That uh, could not be farther from the truth, fortunately. Uh, William Dean, who is the regional administrator of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, has been asked repeatedly, is there anything that could stop relicensing of the Indian Point plant? And he said, well, New York State must issue two separate certificates, one about coastal policies and another about uh, water quality certification. And should New York uh, decline to issue either of those two certificates, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission cannot legally relicense Indian Point. We're going to have time for questions at the end, and I'm going to ask you to hold up index cards uh, that you have filled out for ushers to collect, uh, and we will try to get as many of them answered as possible. Uh, only credentialed media will have the opportunity to ask live questions at the microphone, and I will do my best to bring your questions from the audience to the fore. Uh, now I'm going to introduce Ralph Nader, political activist, author, lecturer, and attorney. Mr. Nader was recently named by The Atlantic as one of the 100 most influential figures in American history, one of only four living people to be so honored. He has launched two major presidential campaigns and founded or organized more than 100 civic organizations. Mr. Nader's groups have made an impact on tax reform, atomic power regulation, the tobacco industry, clean air and water, food safety, access to health care, civil rights, congressional ethics, and much more. He was an early opponent of the nuclear industry starting in 1972 and was co-author of Menace of Atomic Energy. In 1955, Mr. Nader received an Bachelor of Arts, magna cum laude, from Princeton University, and in 1958 he received an LLB with distinction from Harvard University. In his career as a consumer advocate, he founded many organizations, including the Center for the Study of Responsive Law, the Public Interest Research Group, which my daughter had the great pleasure of working for this summer, the Center for Auto Safety, Public Citizen, Clean Water Action Project, the Disability Rights Center, the Pension Rights Center, the Project for Corporate Responsibility, and the Multinational Monitor. Ladies and gentlemen, Ralph Nader. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Galli. And thank uh, the groups in California and New York for making this, uh, <clears throat> this possible. And I understand they're going to Boston uh, tomorrow. I want to thank the former Prime Minister of Japan, Mr. Naoto Kan, for coming here. And I hope that he will tour the world in order to radiate the lessons of Fukushima in a benign manner in order to stop the expansion of atomic energy, which is now moving heavily via its promoters into the developing world where the safeguards, uh, unfortunately, are even uh, lower. And uh, to Dr. Gregory Jasko, I can only say that uh, Senator Markey would be proud of you. <laughs> Arnie Gunderson uh, represents the best in engineering, which is to foresee and forestall. And uh, Peter Bradford, when Peter was with us uh, right out of law school, I told an associate, you're looking at the next governor of Maine some years hence. But our rancid political uh, system has a uh, brilliantly effective way of driving out good public figures uh, and replacing them with rascals. 
Now, I, I don't want to be redundant, and I know a lot of good material has been presented uh, today, uh, but I do want to go through some of the experience here so we can understand what's behind the pressure historically for nuclear power. In 1963, I spent a uh, summer at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory where I was first introduced to nuclear power to produce electricity. And the place was full of engineers and physicists who kept handing my questions uh, between each other, specialties. And I asked them, uh, what's the worst that could happen? I always approached any new technology with that fundamental question. What's the worst that could happen? And they could never tell me. All they could tell me were, were the vi risks were vanishingly small and the defenses in depth were formidable. Those were the jargons of the time. What was interesting about that in the uh, mid-60s is that the projection for nuclear power uh, was extremely ambitious. The Atomic Energy Commission pr predicted that there would be 100 nuclear plants in California alone by the year 2000. That's about one for every 11 miles on the coastline, coastline. But what happened in the meantime was two interesting developments. One, we held mass training exercises in 1973-74 in Washington, D.C., where people from all over the country, near existing plants or proposed nuclear plants, came to learn about this industry, learn about how they could participate at the design stage and the construction stage, to learn about evacuation plans, uh, to learn about what they were never taught in school and never told by newspapers, never informed about just how much radioactivity is in a thousand megawatt plant, which is hundreds of times more than the radioactivity from the Hiroshima uh, bomb. Those people went back home and they organized the resistance to nuclear power. There hasn't been a single nuclear plant ordered, licensed, and placed in operation to produce electricity since the mid-70s. The, the analog to that effort was Wall Street. Nuclear power increasingly became uneconomic, and Wall Street would not fund it without more and more government supports and guarantees. Uh, nuclear power arose out of a group of scientists and engineers who harbored more than a reasonable guilt complex for the uses of their knowledge in producing the atomic bomb. And out of World War II, this guilt complex transferred to a hope that there would be atoms for peace. In 1952, President Truman's Materials Policy Committee issued a report saying that the country should go solar. And by 1975, two-thirds of all residences would be solarized. Unfortunately, two years later, under President Eisenhower, the country decided to go nuclear under the Atoms for Peace program. Some of our most brilliant scientists and engineers were behind that effort, coming out of the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which were deliberate targeting of civilians to use the military's phrase in World War II to, in order to, quote, terrorize the population and reduce the morale in the countries that attacked us. Just think of that, to terrorize the population. That's where that guilt complex came from. And there were many, many discussions privately between these scientists and engineers who came out of the Manhattan Project about how they could redeem themselves 
and the Atoms for Peace. I remember as a youngster being told that there would be a little bit of a at atomized gadget in cars and you'd never have to fill up your cars with gasoline. Nuclear power was told to be too cheap to meter by a government official. When I was at Oak Ridge, I had a conversation with Dr. Alvin Weinberg, which extended in subsequent years. Dr. Weinberg was a great promoter of nuclear power, but he's extremely knowledgeable about its hazards. He wanted nuclear power plants to be built six at a time in a highly barricaded location run by what he called a nuclear priesthood, namely the best and the brightest. When I asked him who would be running the railroads and the trucking companies transporting radioactive waste, he got the message. But later on, he told me something very interesting. He said, if solar power ever came down to being only two and a half times more expensive than atomic energy, he would support solar energy over atomic energy. You can imagine the knowledge of risk that was behind that statement. We must remember one thing here. The uranium mines, the uranium radioactive tailings around those mines, the development of the fuel rods, the transportation to the location where the nuclear plant is, the creation of these nuclear plants with enormous complexities, the production of radioactive waste, which still do not have a permanent waste disposal, and all the problems appurtenant to a deadly substance that had to be 100% controlled, 99% is not enough. It was, a it was a technology that had one bite of the apple. All of this and the storage for tens of thousands of years of radioactive waste had one purpose, to boil water, to produce steam, or other reactor designs to produce heat. Now, the question that was very rarely asked in secret congressional hearings was, Aren't there other ways to boil water without all the continuum of risk involved in the nuclear fuel cycle? It's often said that nuclear power is, is needed because of the climate change. Number one, you need a lot of coal to burn to enrich the uranium. That's often not mentioned. Number two, as Amory Lovins has said repeatedly, if you take the investment in nuclear and put it in solar renewable, other forms of renewable and conservation, you'd get far more BTUs, far more efficiently, far more safely, and far more benignly for climate change. <clears throat> We must remember that the price we pay for nuclear power up front, we pay as consumers and as taxpayers. Tens of billions of dollars have gone into developing the science, the technology, and the operating applications of nuclear power paid by you, the taxpayers. That does not show up on your electric bill. We're dealing here with a silent, cumulative form of violence that does not leave empirically sensitive traces until it's too late. Therefore, it puts the public off guard. In comparison with a fire, we know what to do. 
we flee the fire and or try to put it out. The silent violence of radioactivity does not provoke the sensory responses in order to activate better choices. I find that the arguments against nuclear power are overwhelming. The answer is we've never had a, a class nine meltdown in the United States. You had a very serious one in Chernobyl where now there are hundreds of square kilometers uninhabitable except for the wild animals and the rodents and a few birds. Villages and towns evacuated. You have Fukushima, which continues to boil up its tragic results. In our country, we had a number of close calls inviting the metaphor of playing Russian roulette with the American people and the land of our country. In the 1960s, the Atomic Energy Commission issued a report which said that a class nine meltdown in one nuclear plant could contaminate, quote, an area the size of Pennsylvania, end quote. Is this the kind of gamble we wanna take in order to boil water when there are so many other superior ways to meet our energy needs, as Peter Bradford and others earlier today have pointed out. <clears throat> My list of charges against nuclear power, all of them begin with the letter U. Nuclear power is unnecessary, uneconomic, unsafe, uninsurable, unevacuable, unfinanciable, unaccountable, and undemocratic. <laughs> it's unnecessary because it is not a matter of nuclear power or coal. It's a matter of nuclear power or the hor horrendously wonderful opportunities for conservation. We waste well over half of our energy in the United States, even by comparison with Western Europe. By comparison with realizable practical technology, we probably waste over two thirds. A megawatt you do not waste is a megawatt you do not have to produce. You must never forget that the fastest, quickest, cleanest, most efficient, most job intensive, most decentralized form of energy today is not to waste it. Whether it's retrofitting buildings, motor vehicles, lighting, heating, air conditioning, industrial engines, and so on. The other alternatives are clear. Finally, solar is coming into its own. Wind power is creating more BTUs worldwide now than nuclear. And we are seeing a fast rising local industry called rooftop solar installation, led by many, many jobs being created in California and spreading around the country. Nuclear power is uneconomic because first of all, we pay for it in many ways beyond just the electricity bill. We pay for it, as I said, with tax dollars. We pay for it in many other collateral ways that an economy has to adjust to such a dangerous industry. National security ways, for example. It's uneconomic uh, by the admission of the industry itself, as Peter Bradford pointed out, you're beginning to see cancellations of the recent new proposals to build nuclear plants, Florida being one, Georgia may not be far away, but in both those states, consumers were required to pay up front 
for the cost of the nuclear plant before a shovel hit the ground. I'll get to that in a moment. It's uneconomic because Wall Street says it's uneconomic. Warren Buffett says nuclear power is uneconomical. Wall Street will not lend utilities money to build a nuclear plant without just about 100% loan guarantee from Uncle Sam, you the taxpayer. Uh, nuclear power cannot meet market tests. This uh, has always intrigued me why the Tea Party right-wing free market Milton Friedman types would not come out against nuclear power because it's basically government-guaranteed industry. One reason, of course, is the political and economic power of a government-guaranteed industry, funneling big money to politicians and, in effect, convincing those who need convincing on other than rational grounds that there's no alternative to nuclear power. It's unsafe. It's unsafe because of earthquakes, because of human error, because of malfunctioning equipment, because of sabotage. Every nuclear plant is a national security peril. It's unsafe because there's no place acceptable by the local population to store it, the waste, low-level waste, high-level waste, spent fuel rods are piling up next to nuclear power plants. That's a clear target for sabotage, if not seismic exposure. It's uninsurable from the beginning. The government had to pass the Price-Anderson Act, which in effect said that the insurance companies would not insure nuclear power. Therefore, apart from a fractional bit of insurance, the great bulk of economic risk from a nuclear power accident would be on the taxpayer's back. That's the meaning of Price-Anderson, which is renewed every decade or so. It's unevacuable, and this comes to Indian Point. Any nuclear plant that does not have a live drill to make sure that its evacuation plan is anything other than a fantasy plan cannot be allowed to operate. Indian Point is 30 miles or so north of Manhattan, much closer to New York City than Fukushima is to Tokyo. There is no practical evacuation plan that could work in that area, not just 10 miles out, 20, 30 miles, 50 miles, you have 19 million people. People can hardly get out of New York City at rush hour time. Can anybody credibly present a scenario where given our transportation lockups and the density of population and the panic that would occur and the lack of any drills, the lack of any practice other than paper models, that that area around Indian Point can be evacuated? And as you know, Indian Point has been rife with problems, replete with waivers, near active earthquake zones, aging, decaying. Indian Point 1 shut down years ago. Indian Point 2 and 3 up for recertification by a compliant Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Nuclear power is unfinanceable. I've I've gone through that. It doesn't meet a market test. It is basically a government sanctioned and funded industry. Nuclear power is really unregulatable. There are good people at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Two of them are sitting here. They harbor their doubts. I saw the eyes of Chairman Jasko when I asked him, 
would he favor a real life evacuation drill around Indian Point? And I think you told me that's not practical. But I don't think you believed it. I still think it's unpractical. Yes, uh, it may be unpractical. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on what you mean by that, huh? Um, in fact, that's, that's the answer, isn't it? <laughs> it couldn't happen because you couldn't evacuate people. But the NRC, uh, being the heir to the Atomic Energy Commission, inherited some of its deficiencies. One is, it still has a promotional attitude, even though it was split to be regula regulatory agency and Department of Energy, supposed to be the promotional, when the Atomic Energy Commission that preceded it had both, which is a rather conflict of missions. We must remember that an unregulable industry under the guise of regulation lulls people into a false sense of security. But regularly the Union of Concerned Scientists and others get inside memorandums and reports or the NRC releases reports that show a rather terribly dismaying picture of these aging, corroding nuclear plants. Remember, we almost had a disaster several decades ago at Browns Ferry when a repair person was looking for something in the under cable area of the plant with a candle. The candle started a fire with the polyurethane foam spreading through the cables. This is a giant nuclear plant. The emergency crews came. They tried every high-tech way to put out the fire until the bystanding local fire chief suggested water. And they put it out with an old technique known as H2O. There was the near disaster at Fermi in Michigan, which prompted the outcry by one of the people there afterwards saying, quote, we almost lost Detroit, end quote. There is Three Mile Island. There is Davis Bessie, not that many years ago, less than an inch of a critical piece of metal corroding kept it from being a serious accident. How many times do we have to play Russian roulette? Above all, it's an undemocratic technology. It was born in secrecy. It grew to prevalence in secrecy. It had severe restrictions on local participation in the design and construction stage. In recent years, the restrictions were even more pronounced. Now you just have one avenue of challenge. They combined the two. The industry working overtime to keep the people out, to shut them out from the process of putting a plant where they live, work, and raise their children. This is an inherently coercive technology promoted by a secular religion, nuclearism. It's coercive of taxpayers who are forced to guarantee the plants. It's coercive of ratepayers who are forced to front load the cost of the plants. And it's coercive of the citizenry who have very little voice in foreseeing and forestalling a calamity. Let me just end on this note. While we have to be very concerned about atomic energy in our country, as the orders dry up in the, develop, in the developed nations, the industry's sales people are pushing into countries that are developing rapidly but have less of an infrastructure and thereby a much higher risk of disaster. Even in the United 
Arab Emirates, where the sunlight is unsurpassed, where there is oil and gas all around, the country has cut a deal with a South Korean firm, $40 billion deal for multiple power plants. This co company is subcontracting to U.S. and European contractors. And the United Arab Emirates is the size of Maine. That's not a very stable area of the world. They're being built in India. Already, radioactive waste has been dumped into the ocean for years. The safeguards are not anywhere near what they should be in those densely populated areas. So the cause of stopping nuclear power for all these and other reasons is a great, great one. Because in its place, it will usher in the future forms of energy for the planet Earth, which are renewable, all forms of solar energy, and energy efficiency at a level that engineers have been telling us is possible, practical, cost-effective for many, many years. And we haven't been sufficiently listening, although there have been significant advances in energy conservation. Now, I have a local plea for people in the New York City area. You have on record Hillary Clinton, Elliot Spitzer, Andrew Cuomo coming down against relicensing Indian Point. Build on that. Increasingly support the citizen groups around Indian Point, some, many of whom are here today, in order to shut that dual nuclear power plant installation down and replace it with energy efficiency and for transition, almost anything is better than nuclear, whether it's water power from Canada, whether it's reshifting capacities not fully used in the rest of the state down to the New York City area, or even a fossil fuel as a transition. Some of you may have seen that movie, On the Beach, which dealt with the effects of a nuclear bomb. There needs to be another movie. It's called On the Hudson, Indian Point. The way to arouse people around Indian Point is to repeatedly demand a real life drill for the evacuation plan they're supposed to be putting in your local libraries and making public. And not just 10 miles around, where there may be 280,000 people, but go out 20 or 30. I believe it was Chairman Jasko who recommended that Americans evacuate 50 miles away from Fukushima. 50 miles means over 18 million people. And I have one more plea. Find a very rich person, <laughs> whether it's a billionaire or a mega millionaire, and I understand there are quite a few of them in the New York City area. Sit down with those people, one at a time. Show them the kind of materials, the presentations that you've seen today. Give them a sense of posterity Give them an opportunity to move from their success to their significance and have them fund a major mobilization of the greater New York City area to shut down Indian Point and begin rolling back nuclear power throughout the country. So you can meet the people who, in California who are rolling it back out of that state. The great point about this meeting and others is that you see people who were once viewing nuclear power as promising. But as Alfred North Whitehead said, 
they kept in their mind options open for revision. We haven't seen enough scientists in the nuclear industry who can keep, quote, options open for revision, end quote. Although there have been a number of nuclear, of Nobel laureates like Henry Kendall and Alphine from Sweden, who, who did keep options open for revision and oppose nuclear power. But that's what we have to ask for. More people out of the industry, out of the NRC, out of the Department of Energy, basically saying there's a better way, there's a safer way, there's a more environmentally benign way, there's a more respectful way for the land and for our descendants, if only to keep our descendants from cursing us. Thank you. Ralph Nader, thank you. If any of those billionaires or multimillionaires are, are in the room or are watching the live stream, uh, our, our number at Riverkeeper is, is easily accessible on the net, and we're happy to partner with you on that mass movement.